Hi, I'm Mike Shaw, and I'm also known as the Space Bear Hunter. And um, I'll just quickly tell you how I got that name. Um, when my children were in middle school, they uh, they had to do, am I unmuted? Yeah, you yeah can hear you're me? unmuted, you're fine. When my children were in middle school, um, they were doing a science fair project and I helped them with the microscope and we discovered tardigrades. So I decided at that time to do a scientific project and look for them wherever I could. I lived in New Jersey at the time. Well, um, one, uh, a media company got a hold of me when they sent tardigrades into space and they asked me some questions and they interviewed me. And that's how tardigrades started to get pretty popular. So I wrote a scientific paper and some, uh, a couple of books for kids and teachers to do science fair projects. And now I'm going to share with you how you can find tardigrades in your own backyard. Um, it's relatively simple. And um, I'd like to thank Anali um, for uh, having me on the program and the Pamunkey Regional Library as well. So I'll get started right now. Please um, feel free to type your questions in the chat and then Anali will come back to me um, and we'll answer those questions about the halfway through. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. And let's see, you tell me when you can see it. I can see it. Okay, so everybody can see the screen. And here we go. So this is um, just a quick overview of what you would need in order to find tardigrades in your backyard. So let's start with the first slide. Bear with me, please, one second. There we go. So tardigrades are microscopic creatures, right? They're very tiny. Now they can be as large as one millimeter in size, which is very big when it comes to microscopes. Um, usually when we look at something under the microscope, it's way, way smaller than a millimeter in size. So tardigrades really are pretty big under the microscope. If you were to just read a sentence in a book, the period at the end of that sentence, that little dot at the end of that sentence is about a millimeter in size. So you could really see tardigrades um, just by looking at them with a magnifying glass, but it would just look like, they would just look like a little tiny white dot. They'd still be very hard to see. So you need, you need some sort of a microscope in order to see them. Where do we find tardigrades? These are little creatures that live in moist environments. Tardigrades need to be wet all the time in order to survive. They, they live in lichen, moss, and leaf litter. So moss you can easily find um, in forests, in the shady areas of forests, and sometimes on the sides of trees. And lichen is that fluffy, fuzzy stuff that you usually see on um, the, si the shady side of a tree. And these are some pictures, so you can see what, what moss and lichen look like. And you can even find them in leaf litter, sometimes on the roof, not that I'm suggesting you go up to the roof of your house, but in the gutters on the roof where leaves collect, they've found tardigrades. They're harmless and they're cute. And why do we call them water bears? Because they look like little bears. I just uh, have a picture here of a grizzly, grizzly bear, and you could see how similar it is to a tardigrade. They have little claws like bears, they have puffy legs. So they look just like them really, they don't have a tail. And they, but they have eight legs rather than four. They also have two eyes, a nose and a mouth. So they're very similar in appearance to a bear. Where do they live? Tardigrades really live everywhere, uh, even though they're so tiny. So we don't really notice them and they can withstand extreme heat and cold. So they're in the desert and they're in the Arctic and they've even been found in Antarctica. Um, since you find them, 
you find them everywhere. How do they survive? Well, I'll tell you that in a minute, but how long do they live? They live about a hundred years. They've been frozen, defrosted, put under pressure, subjected to high temperatures, and even zapped with x-rays. Now, we humans couldn't survive all of that, and most animals cannot survive all these extremes in temperature and in their environment. But tardigrades can survive. I'm going to tell you how. They protect themselves by going into a type of hibernation, just like a bear goes into hibernation in the winter. What they do is they go into this hibernation and it's called cryptobiosis. And they curl up and form a hard shell around themselves and they contract into a little ball. This little ball is called a tun, T-U-N. And you can see some pictures of how the process looks. They form a little shell around their body, almost like a spacesuit, and then they get really small into a little, little tiny ball. And here's some pictures of showing you actually how the tardigrade looks under the microscope when it's contracted. On the left, you can see that it's the tardigrade's getting smaller and contracting into its tun state. And then on the right, it's fully contracted. And that's what the, this little tun looks like. Now, what's amazing is there's no sign of life whatsoever in this tun state. And that's how they can survive for 100 years. The lifespan of a tardigrade may only be a few years, two or three years. But since they contract and preserve themselves in the tun state, they do this on and off, on and off. That may last for about 100 years. They've even defrosted a, a tardigrade um, that was 30 years old in a sample that was in a museum. They found some moss in a museum and they looked in it and they found a tardigrade that was 30 years old. But the tardigrade might have been contracted all that time. So that, that's how they do it. Now, how do they do it? The moisture in their body, just like we have moisture in our bodies, the moisture in their body, they convert it in, in, into a kind of sugar into a glassy sugar, and that's how they survive. Here's, um, here you can see where the tardigrades have been rehydrated from moss that was 30 years old. Now, recently we sent tardigrades into space. Um, they actually, right now, as we speak, they're in the International Space Station. They just sent up a new batch of tardigrades, and what they're trying to find out is, if the DNA in the tardigrade has some properties that we may be able to find useful in preserving vaccines. Some of you may know that um, due to the coronavirus, we had to um, quickly develop a vaccine and distribute it throughout the world. And that vaccine had to be kept cold, um, very cold in a very cold temperature in order to work. And then when you went to get the shot for the vaccine, they defrosted it. Uh, a few hours earlier than you got your vaccination. Well, what they're studying with tardigrades is, can we find better ways to preserve vaccines without having to freeze them? And they're in this International Space Station right now, and they're doing that research on tardigrades. Now, as I was saying earlier, the easiest place to find tardigrades is in moist lichen, and that's the yellow fuzzy stuff that grows on the shady side of the tree. Now, there's, there are several kinds of lichen. There are actually about 100 different kinds of lichen. But very quickly, if you, if you go outside in your backyard right now and you look at the lichen, if it's crusty like the, like the one shown in the picture, chances are you won't find tardigrades in there. You want to look for lichen that is yellow uh, or greenish yellow and it's softer like, this, like you see on this tree here. What do you put the lichen in? You put it in an ordinary paper bag, like a lunch bag or a small envelope. Um, it's best not to use a plastic bag or a baggie because um, if you use a plastic bag, moisture in the bag will allow mold to grow. So you don't want to use a plastic bag. Use a little paper bag or an envelope when you collect the lichen. How do you do it? Here's how to do it. Basically, you scrape some of the lichen into the paper bag or envelope using a sharp knife. Obviously, you want to be very careful when using a knife. 
it, this is something that would require adult supervision and you hold the blade at a 90 degree angle to the tree and you just scrape it like you're sweeping a broom and the lichen will fall into the envelope. It's a sweeping motion where the sharp end of the blade acts like a broom and the lichen scrapings go right into your envelope. Now, sometimes you can find lichen on a rock or on a brick wall. That's a good type of lichen. Tardy grades are pretty, pretty likely to be found in that kind of a lichen. And this is a really nice picture where you can see moss that's all over the ground and you actually can see moss growing on a tree. So if you have a choice of which moss to, to, to look at, go with something that's on a tree or rock because it will have less dirt in it. So here you can see, you can pull up some clumps of moss, um, but a tree has less dirt in it, so that's preferable. And just put a few handfuls, a few pinches of moss into your paper bag. Let's take some questions, if anybody has any questions. Any, any questions so far? Um, okay, no questions so far, and this is great. Well, I did have a question. Sure. Um, so you said that they need to be wet all the time uh, to survive. Does that include in space? Yes, actually, um, uh, in space, what they do is um, they send them up dehydrated in the ton state. So they're not wiggling and moving around. When they get to space, the people in the International Space Station, the scientists there add water and then the tardigrades rehydrate and start to move around. And of course, this is all done um, in the spaceship or in the International Space Station. And um, that's how then they do the experiments and then they dehydrate the tardigrades again. And one of the things they did was they actually, in a different experiment, they took the tardigrades up into space, they rehydrated them and then they opened uh, the chamber and they allowed the vacuum of space to completely dehydrate and expose the tardigrades to um, solar radiation and no air whatsoever. And the tardigrades, when they came back down to Earth, they added water and they were able to survive. Oh, that's very cool. Thank you. We don't have any other questions. Yeah, another question we often get is, um, it, it is about the lifespan. How often do tardigrades dehydrate themselves and rehydrate themselves so they can live such a long time? Well, every time it rains and the trees get wet, all the tardigrades are coming out. Okay, so they're all moving around, they're feeding, they eat lichen, they eat little tiny uh, bacteria, little other, other microorganisms, they uh, eat plant food, and the front of their mouth, they have these little pointy, uh, pointy things that they poke into the vegetation, and then they suck out the, um, the nutrients from the vegetation. And then as soon as the air starts to dry out and it warms up, and the leaves and the moss and the uh, lichen get dry, they go back into the ton state. And then they wait until the next rainfall or the next moisture situation, and they rehydrate and feed. And this, this is the cycle that they go through over and over again. Okay, we just got another question. Sure. And that's, if they can survive in space, then can they survive everywhere? Yeah, the answer to that is so far, the answer is yes, they can survive everywhere. They've been found in the Arctic. Uh, they've been found, um, uh, they've been found uh, at the highest elevations at mountaintops. Uh, they've been found in deserts. So chances are wherever you live, if you go into your backyard and you do a little scraping of lichen on a tree, you're most likely going to find tardigrades. They've been found in almost every state uh, in the United States, but surveys haven't been done. So perhaps, um, you know, if you, if you live in uh, one of the states that hasn't done, uh, hasn't had a survey done, you could find, you could be the first person to discover tardigrades wherever you are. Very cool. Okay, okay that so, looks like so, that's the end of our questions. All right, so let's continue with the next question. 
So what will you need? Let me just double check here, see something. Right. So what will you need once you've got your specimen collected in an envelope or in the paper bag? You'll need a clear dish of some sort. I, I like to use a Petri dish, um, which you see right at the bottom there on the left, but you could use a little clear plastic container like the lid from a food container or even, even the, the top of a little plastic box for cosmetics. Anything is fine where you can put a little water in the bottom. Sometimes even packaging uh, that you find from products you buy in the store that are hanging up on a rack. You could see on the right some packaging. You can cut that up. And as long as you have what's, what, what looks like a little tray where you can put some water, you'll be able to put your specimen of moss or lichen in that. And what you do is you just dump a little bit in, you sprinkle some in, lichen or moss, just a tiny pinch. Remember that you're, be, you're going to be looking at this under a microscope, magnifying a tremendous amount, magnifying what you're looking at. So it would look like a forest, like a huge forest under the microscope. So you really don't need a lot of material in the, di in the dish. I'll just use the word dish, whether it's a Petri dish or a cosmetics container. Then you add a little bottled water. One question we get is what kind of water should you use? You're best using mineral water. If you use tap water, um, it may be, it may have some chlorine in it. If you use uh, distilled water, it doesn't have any nutrients. So bottled water, mineral water is the best water to use. And you just put a little bit in there, just enough to cover the bottom of the dish. Um, I like to use the plastic Petri dish and on my website, which at the end, I'll show you the web, my website address again. I have a list of all the things you need and you'll see also where you can get these things. Most of the things you can buy on Amazon, if you type in uh, plastic Petri dishes, you'll be able to find them online pretty inexpensively. And the reason I like it is so you could cover it um, and it prevents uh, mold spores from getting in there um, and it'll, it'll keep your specimen preserved overnight. Now, uh, you'll need a microscope. So you can, there are lots of different types of microscopes, but the microscope I recommend now for um, initially finding the tardigrade in that Petri dish is a dissecting microscope. And you could see two of them here in the pictures. Um, they're very simple. They're pretty inexpensive. You could get a dissecting microscope from anywhere between $50 to $100 or even less. You can buy them online. And on my website, I show you different kinds and I can give you some recommendations about where to get them. But um, you could see, that's a picture on the right of my daughter when she was in middle school. Um, on the right, she's got, she, we're using a little plastic condiment cup. We're not even using a Petri dish. So these are the little cups you might see in the fast food store uh, where, they, where you can put the ketchup. Um, you can even use the plastic condiment cup to look at tardigrades. And that's the kind of microscope I would recommend. Just to show you, there are better microscopes. And this one here um, is a compound microscope and it has different objective lenses. Um, but you want to use a low magnification. You don't need high power in order to see tardigrades. You just need about 20, 15 to 30 times magnification. 20 would be fine. That's all you need to find a tardigrade. Now, this would be with a compound microscope. There are, these are the objective lenses and they have the different powers. And they're delicate, and you'd have to be really careful not to dunk it into the water. You could see on the right, there's a compound microscope with an objective lens hanging down near the water. And if you lower it too much, it could go into the water, which is why I don't recommend it. But again, you could use a compound microscope, but I'm just saying you just really need to be very careful. So if you're a teacher watching this presentation and you want to use a compound microscope, which you have in the classroom, it's fine. Just be very careful. Now, the next thing you need to do in order to find these tardigrades is take an index card and cover it with some black electrical tape. Or you could use black construction paper and a glue stick to glue some black paper, but you need a black background to put under your specimen dish. You could see in the previous slide, 
I've got that index card with the black uh, electrical tape under the under the specimen dish. You can see that. So what you do is you put the black card on the microscope stage, and on top of it, you put your specimen dish. And the next thing you want to do is set a narrow beam of light from the flashlight across the bottom of the dish. And what that does, and you can even see it in the picture, it lights up the lichen or the moss very brightly from the side. And when you light it up from the side, you'll be able to see tardigrades across the bottom of the dish very brightly. That's the trick in order to see them. So that shows you how they light up very brightly. The horizontal beam makes any tardigrade or other creatures stand out clearly against the black background. And in, on the right, you see another type of dissecting microscope with a Petri dish, a black background, and I have some fancy um, lights that are lighting it from the side, but you can use just an ordinary flashlight. And if you look back here, I just have a, um, a keychain LED light, which I've clipped on a, a little stand. You can make your own, uh, yeah, find your own method to do that. Now, next thing you have to do is focus the microscope on your lowest power on the debris that rests on the bottom of the dish. And these are actual pictures taken through the microscope to kind of show you what you're going to see. Um, it'll be tiny, it'll be moving around, and it may, may be a little fuzzy, not super clear, but you'll know it's a tardigrade because it's moving around. That's another picture. So the light is streaming across the bottom of the dish. And now you'll see it's a huge place to look. The way to do it is you move the dish slowly around and around in circles, starting from the outside, closer and closer to the center, sort of in a spiral looking for tardigrades. Because you're not going to see a tardigrade unless you're super lucky as soon as you look through the microscope. Even though you're focused properly, and you see the moss and the lichen on the dish, you won't necessarily see a tardigrade. You have to do a little hunting. And that's, that's when you become a space bear hunter. You slowly, slowly turn the dish and rotate it towards the center till you find a tardigrade and stop occasionally. And then you might see a tardigrade clinging to the moss or lichen. So don't be discouraged. Um, it took me a long time to find that first tardigrade. Sometimes they can take two or three days to come out of hibernation. So you leave the moss sitting in the moss or lichen sitting in the dish overnight, you stand a very good chance of finding the tardigrades. But sometimes it could take two or three days for these tardigrades to emerge from hibernation. Sometimes you won't find them if you look in another sample of the lichen or moss that you took from the same tree or the same rock, you'll find a tardigrade in there. So they may not be in that little pinch that you put in the dish, but they could be in another pinch in the next pinch you put in another dish. They're there, trust me, but finding that first one could take a while. You're hunting for tardigrades, water bears, and they are slow moving creatures. That's why they're called tardigrades. Tardy means slow, grade means to walk in Latin. So that's why they're named tardigrades. They're not moving around quickly. So this is what they look like at higher power. Now, once you find that tardigrade, um, you know, and it, again, it'll look something like that. If you wanna see what it looks like at higher power, you will need a compound microscope. And what you would do in that case is transfer the tardigrade from the dish using an eyedropper. You would transfer it to a slide. And on my website, there's more explaining it. And I have a course teaching you exactly how to do that. So this is some more pictures I've taken showing you how tardigrades look at higher magnification. And here's my website, tardigrade.us. And on, the, on my website, you will find um, a free book with step-by-step -step instructions, which I've just explained now, but a lot more detail. You can download the free book from my website and it'll show you actually step-by-step -step how to move the tardigrade from the dish to the slide 
how to put the slide on the compound microscope stage, and then how to look at it, and even how to photograph the tardigrade using your cell phone camera. Here's a nice picture of one. Well, the expression is, your first tardigrade is the hardest to find. And that's true. That'll be the hardest tardigrade. But once you find one, you'll know what they look like and how to, how, how to find them. And it'll be easier to find your next tardigrade. So if you enjoyed this tutorial and want to learn more, again, my website is posted right here. Um, and on my website, you will find it, complete information about my tardigrade course. You'll also um, see the book you can buy on Amazon called Kids and Teachers Tardigrade Science Project Book. But there is a free book similar to that with a lot of the information which you can download from my website for free. So I would recommend you get that book for free. And then um, if you have questions, my website also has a contact page. You can always email me or send me questions and I'll be happy to answer and help you if you have any questions about the process or where you're at or if you'd like to know anything at all. So feel free. And if you have any more questions, um, Anneli, please uh, let me know. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Put them in the chat. Um, someone says, amazing, thank you so much. And another, I can't wait to start searching for tardigrades. Thank and you. And another says, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I think maybe what we could do is put in the chat my, my website, I'll go ahead and type that in um, and see if, yeah, that should go in. Make sure it's in there. Yes. So feel free, you know, contact me if you have, if you think of any other questions and be sure to download the free book. And if you're a teacher, I have a page on my website with teacher resources, crossword puzzle, tardigrade crossword puzzles. Feel free to download that as well. A tardigrade maze, um, which you can do, uh, which is fun to do the tardigrade maze. I have some games and things you can download from my website. There's a tardigrade fact card and there are tardigrade videos as well uh, on my website as well and some tardigrade information. So I hope that's been helpful. Oh, they okay. said so they have the book. Great. Very good. Um, so if you have any questions for Mr. Sean, now's the time to ask them. All right, and we want to thank Mr. Shaw so much. And thank you, Anneli. Appreciate it. it. Very cool. All right, and if you have it, because it always happens to me, as soon as I log off, I go, oh, I wish I had asked. Well, now you know that you can contact Mr. Shaw directly and ask him any questions if you think about it in 15 minutes. Okay, sounds great. And thanks again. Thank you, Pamunkey Regional Library. All right. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And um, there's still time to sign up for summer reading, just in case you haven't. Um, lots of prizes still waiting to be claimed. And we want to thank Mr. Shaw very much for his wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And we're going to sign out. So. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.